Jaun Andreo, Karratxaldeon, Azkuna Zentruaren izenean, ongi etorri gutun Zuria Bilboko leten. Welcome to Gutun Zuria, to the sort of literature festival Gutun Zuria. We have this Mark Places uh, program to develop the way in which uh, arts and culture can be perceived and consumed. Using digital technologies, new ways uh, to do cultural intermediation. So every day here, uh, we have it uh, present to the technology, and this is why we are mentioning it uh, here. Now we're going to talk about uh, photographic uh, fiction. And our, with uh, our guest uh, this uh, afternoon that will sign books after nine in the literature room. Very simultaneous translation for you to know so you can follow in Basque, Spanish and English. To repeat in Spanish the same. Now, yes, after Hand in hand, we have uh, three of the main actors of uh, this uh, field. We have uh, John Fork Huerta, Cristina Medel, and uh, Agustin Fernandez Mayo. Funk Huerta, he has uh, won the National Essay Award and also the uh, National Photography uh, Award. Christian Middle, he also got the award on photography, and uh, he is an she's an antidote uh, against the arts and literature. So, as I said, we have also with us Agustin Fernandez, and uh, he got the Prevail Award to last year. He is a uh, writing; it's a combination of uh, audiovisual images and uh, writing. I hope you all enjoy this uh, talk in Guten Syria. Thank you very much. Buenas noches. En el año 2008, la, la Galería de Exposiciones de Barbican... 2008, the Barbican Gallery in London organized a very a peculiar exhibition, a series of, a series of artists do the first Martian. Done by some experts in Martians. They had to redefine from the point of view that would be that of somebody not living in planet Earth, art. So this review of what we have conceived as uh, art along uh, history, but seen from the point of view of somebody that does not uh, sort of manage all these uh, definitions, um, lead to different ensembles in between different genres that is very, very peculiar. Is very peculiar. So this idea 
of uh, somebody from outer space uh, landing on uh, um, planet Earth. So a Martian. So Martian, if we say, say what this is. A Martian will sort of uh, hold a glass, look at around and say, maybe in planet Earth uh, they've got this kind of a container what they uh, pour water or something else. What well, am I telling you this anecdote? Because uh, when we do art and even when we do science, what we are usually doing is we're working with the idea of translation. That is, we have the material in front of our eyes and we translate it into a language that is allegedly the language of every artist and hopefully it will be a Martian language, kind of a Martian language. This is my idea of a creator that is the person that make us see what we've already uh, been seeing in a different way. So this is something we uh, see as daily objects. You don't have to go very far away to find that raw material that we have in our uh, daily life uh, to produce uh, pieces of art. This is why Dr. Yeski used to say, I've got a project to go crazy. This is a very good idea because as a project, it is already under control because uh, creating is kind of a controlled uh, uh, craziness or madness. And in my very much admired uh, Joan von Cuberta and Cristina de Midel, they do that. They come here as Martians and they tell us or they give us another way uh, to look at what we've been looking at every day. This is why now it's very uh, in vogue uh, to say that many exhibitions should be about uh, shamans and magicians, uh, about magic, but art itself is uh, magic, something magic is to make people see something there that is not there really, but always with the intention of uh, making uh, people think. So the first voice, a recorded voice uh, that we've uh, documented is that of uh, the poet Walt Whitman. In 1819, he told his uh, poem, America. It was uh, recorded in a, s a cylinder of uh, wax, uh, and this uh, Walter Whitman's uh, voice is the oldest uh, recording that we have. So this might uh, make us think if this dates back from 1890, we don't even know how our great uh, grandfathers used to speak because we have no recordings. And so we don't know how a Roman would say uh, Romae or a Greek uh, man would say Poiesis. So if we've been just uh, extrapolating or guessing how a Roman man would say that, but we don't know really how it did sound because we didn't have any recordings. This is very interesting. So from a material that we consider as uh, true, we uh, build a fiction. And this is the fiction that uh, somebody in Rome would say Rosal. When I uh, heard the paleontologist uh, talking, and uh, this uh, paleontologist, uh, he said, we didn't, I mean, we don't really have a clue of what a dinosaur looked uh, like. We only work with sort of the hardware, that means with the bones, with the teeth, and everything that is soft tissue, we have to sort of make it up, or I guess, what it was like. So whenever we see uh, drawings of dinosaurs, they are only fictions. And if we take this into uh, history, history is a fiction because we take some facts as uh, true and then we make up some parts in order to agree that things happened in such or such way. 
Why am I telling you all this? Because as I see these, my two colleagues here, they work uh, using this uh, method that to me is the real method that you have to use if you want to, uh, by means of imagination, turn something into true. So, from soft uh, tissues, for, from sort uh, parts that we consider as true, they, they build uh, something to reach somewhere. Not just to produce uh, a vain uh, fantasy or an innocuous fantasy, to review from a critical point of view the uh, concepts of uh, true or lie or even the concept of uh, 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 the museum as an institution or even the idea that photography, uh, same as go for literature and or even science, They're not really uh, like a uh, forensic uh, and uh, they don't really have the possibility to document uh, the world. So the best way to talk about uh, what is real is to never try to describe it because there you just like are very naive and you are trying to think that of photography or even um, uh, An artery will tell you what is true and what is not true. Up until some years ago, the main idea of postmodernism was uh, the word relato, that is tale. So any alleged uh, true is uh, community construction. So the best way to talk about uh, what is true is to go to the sides, to the edges. We might use absurd uh, humor to do so. It is a very interesting way to do a research on reality. When Duchamp in uh, 1916 uh, set a piece of a uh, toilet in a museum, this is a very kind of absurd and ridiculous, but it sort of redefines a whole story of uh, art. And this sort of uh, sheds some light in the, the future realities or about the future realities. So I think the works that Joanne and Christina are going to be uh, talking about today here, they are going to show to us two series each. So. Jan will start. He will be talking about Sputnik. There was a TV show that had some uh, doubts on, on it. Uh, even though the, the program is not very good, but the treasure of the program is very, very good. Then, Christina will talk about another series that is somehow related conceptually to Sputnik's, Sputnik by uh, Joan, and she's going to talk about the Ophronaut, Ophronauta. And then, about by means of the idea of what spams are in the current times, all these uh, sort of garbage information that we get into our emails or fake information, they've uh, produced two very interesting uh, pieces. Uh, Joan Font Coverta, he will talk uh, about his uh, series called uh, Holy Innocence, Santa Innocencia, dates uh, from uh, 2010. It's a book, and he will explain uh, that book. And then Christina, she will talk about poly spam. And this is related to one of the uh, 
titles of this uh, festival. Uh, never real, always true. So what is uh, true is there. And it means that a group of uh, people or an amount of people agrees about something uh, that is uh, true. And this is what we're always uh, asking from some of our ideas today so they don't betray uh, the starting point. So with this short introduction, I would just like to say that we'll be uh, watching things related to fantasy, a fantasy that makes us think about uh, what is real. Some uh, three days ago, Senator Felosia, the writer, died, and uh, he's, he's got a very good line, and he says that Walt Disney was the biggest uh, infant uh, corruptor ever. And in fact, he would uh, present as animals in a way that, are very, that is very untrue. So we see animals as uh, people, and these make us see how we are and how they are, not because animals uh, think or talk. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues, to Jan Font Cuverta, and he will explain uh, his work. Well, before we start with all these uh, Martian ideas that Agustin uh, sort of uh, mentioned, very briefly, I would like to thank you for inviting us to Gutun Surya uh, for, um, for uh, debate, for intelligence, uh, which I think is especially necessary nowadays when we see these uh, sort of uh, drift when there is this lack of uh, uh, freedom of expression and I think uh, the only way out is uh, culture and art. So I'm going to show to you two projects. This one is uh, Sputnik that I started in 1990. The year before two important things happened. It was the falling down of the Berlin Wall and then also the appearance of a Photoshop. And these two things make me think that I have to go into a different narrative. Who's coming from the uh, photo uh, montage, the photo uh, shopping? And I was uh, used to retouching uh, uh, pictures and photographies, but with new Photoshop uh, software, uh, our uh, possibilities would multiply and then we will get read of uh, fiction and uh, get into uh, storytelling. And uh, I think uh, this is a storytelling about the dark phase of the uh, Soviet Union, but not having the will of acting as, as uh, a historian, but rather to use this framework as a reference that can be also linked to many other situations of manipulation, where uh, historical memory has been under attack. So the starting point is that under, in 1993, South Sea, after the falling of the um, uh, Soviet Union, they would organize an auction with uh, the uh, clothes of the astronauts, uh, so with letters, with uh, photography, some parts and pieces from the uh, space uh, crafts. And uh, this auction in New York was very successful. And uh, so it, they did repeat it. And then it was in all the media. A journalist from Washington Post went to the auction to write a chronicle. And uh, he realizes 
that there is a batch, uh, a lot, that is uh, not uh, very expensive and that was not uh, sold. So he decided to uh, bid uh, for it and uh, bought it. And this was uh, this was a group of cosmonauts. And he there, he recognized, and also because there was these uh, signatures in all these uh, uh, pictures, and he re recognized the Perigovoy, the man that was driving the Soyuz uh, 3, and only this one, the third one on the left, Ivan Stashnikov, he was surprised. He didn't know who this guy was. He wasn't very popular. And so he had this sort of uh, click moment. He went, goes back to his library where he's got all these books on the history of uh, the, uh, all the uh, trips to the moon and so on to the space uh, by the Russians. So he finds everything possible about everybody else but about this uh, man. So we know during the Stalin uh, times, maybe Trotsky went into this grace and he would be rejected from every or uh, deleted from every uh, document, official document, and even children would have to write uh, the enemy of uh, people in the, his uh, books. But this cosmonaut, this humble cosmonaut, I don't know what harm he did uh, to the political commissars of the time, so he was so much uh, censured in the, all these documents. And this made the uh, uh, journalists uh, be very uh, curious about it and uh, start a research. Uh, so to cut a long story short, Stotnikov, uh, he was a very mysterious uh, uh, character. And the important thing about him is that he finally found out that he was uh, removed from uh, the photographies because uh, his mission failed. And then the Soviet uh, authorities didn't want to recognize that failure. So he decided that the best way to avoid uh, that issue was to remove uh, this uh, character as if he had never uh, existed. They had to send the family to be like in uh, Siberia, remove his uh, face from every picture. So this journalist, he tries to sort of trace back uh, the life and the story of this man that disappeared, that vanished. And of course, that is myself. So this is the story of an attack to the... Uh, historic archives. So I had to visit every archive, searching for images where I could uh, interpose my image as if I was that cosmonaut. And with all that, I create a story, a tale that would be like a parody of those uh, images that are manipulated during those uh, uh, times of all these dictators. So this took a long time. It was as um, recording a film, but I was going to do it not on a film, but I was going to uh, do it in a public way and in the shape of an installation. And that will be uh, shown in uh, places uh, talking about the story of uh, the uh, space uh, race and so on. So some places, where a visitor would not expect this to happen. So people would attend those exhibitions expecting to find a show and something related to the story of cosmonauts. And then they would bump into this kind of, uh, you know, these clothes uh, from uh, all these uh, space uh, vessels. But little by little, they would uh, find these uh, funny things like in a room with a very uh, cold and mysterious uh, light. There would be this window case with a um, piece of uh, rock that uh, allegedly sort of crashed against uh, his uh, vessel. But this uh, is... Uh, this uh, meteorite uh, was uh, made of uh, kryptonite, and this is not very common in planet Earth. So little by little, some things would give uh, people uh, hints that uh, really they were attending to a fiction. 
and these are historic uh, photographies uh, that uh, I got from uh, some archives in the 60s and to the real cosmonaut I add my face so I am telling the story, telling the story of this cosmonaut visiting schools and hospitals. That is the political use of these uh, heroes, and uh, well, all these um, up until uh, up until when he's about to get into his uh, spacecraft uh, or spaceship and face the great adventure. So this is a book uh, with uh, a lot of uh, text. There's an important uh, work of literature. And it is like a science fiction novel, but presented as a journalistic uh, chronicle written by these uh, correspondent by the Washington Post. So I am sort of uh, transgressing some uh, genres. So if I present this as a novel, well, people will understand this uh, from the very beginning, but if I present this with some pseudo or scientific documents within a scientific uh, space and with, that, with data that are true, that you can verify historically, then the confusion starts to grow bigger and bigger. But from time to time, then we have these uh, funny pictures that not even the biggest believer will uh, sort of consider as true. So these uh, only uh, people see them uh, by the time they're already into the story. And then uh, here the cosmonaut disappears, but uh, there is a vodka bottle navigating, sailing around uh, the cosmos with a SOS message inside of it. And then in this uh, window case, the cosmonaut was uh, traveling with, uh, um, with a dog. And for the dog not to get bored, uh, she uh, would be eating these uh, rubber uh, bones. So all this was very much documented. But little by that would also give some hints to the public uh, to know that this is kind of uh, a joke and this is a supposed uh, asteroid or meteorite uh, that went through his uh, vision field and this is a fake uh, a picture that I do at home in my kitchen table with some flour when I was just like cooking a crepe so this is not a mere rhetoric, uh, artistic uh, fiction. Once you create uh, the story, the project starts. And this is what we call a fake in art. A fake uh, also to do uh, political uh, activism. And this is to try to cheat on people. So somehow fiction is somehow credible and you only unveil it at the very end. Only at the end you unveil that is fiction. And this to me is very pedagogic. I've been using many uh, strategies to do so, so I like to translate uh, this story into uh, uh, an article in a journal. Uh, sometimes I sort of cheat uh, on newspapers and I try to tell them this is true. Sometimes I publish it and maybe a week later I unveil that this was just uh, a fake or bullshit. And uh, I really like one when uh, some journal journalists, they go on holidays in summertime and you only have there the interns and I sell them, send them some uh, press uh, uh, little small press uh, articles and as they are very lazy they think it is true they don't really take them out and uh, they would uh, end up on the newspapers and I really like the consequences I've got many journalists uh, that sort of uh, believed it and then presented this story as uh, true and then like in this particular case there is a singer by Madrid Isabel Leon she published a book for uh, Limbo Star, uh, 
and uh, she believed the whole story. She thought it was uh, great, this idea of a cosmonaut lost with a dog in the uh, space, and she devoted a whole record, and the record got to the market, and it was very nice. And when she published uh, the record, she thought, that all this was uh, true, that this was a historic uh, event. Then we um, met, we had some beers together and a good laugh. And then also, as Agustin mentioned, in a well-known uh, TV show on science fiction and unsolved mysteries, this one was devoted to the space and they presented the story of this ghost or cosmonaut as the main a thing for that uh, night. It was uh, very ridiculous and these underlined that, that uh, sometimes journalists are not, uh, do not f check facts. And that there is um, fact checking should be done even if the news is very interesting. And then we've got this book with all the data that is a parody of the design and the layout of the Soviet books uh, that date back from the 60s. And uh, in order to make this uh, storytelling be more sort of a true, I disappear as an author. I am never here the author of these uh, pictures and my name does not appear in the book. So there's an alleged Sputnik, Sputnik uh, trust that is sort of the one leading and managing uh, this uh, project. And I am only there, my presence there is by means of my face in that uh, And Stotnikov means, uh, is a translation of my family name uh, that means hidden uh, fontaine. So, well, I start with a list of all the uh, trustees, and you have the Kamarashovs, uh, brothers, and many other that will not be very common to find them there. So, there are many tricks in these books, uh, and also in the back cover. Uh, it says in Russian, everything is fiction, and it's in flashy green, but only if you know Russian, you will know about it. And only if you've left the book open uh, under uh, some light, then it, this, uh, this kind of uh, letters will become sort of a, a flashy green, and you will then find out that something in Russian is saying that this is all a joke. This was uh, quite a complex uh, project. I needed a documentalist to work with me, some uh, Russian translators. The book is in Russian, by the way, in Spanish and English nowadays. And uh, so I needed a team. I had to travel to Russian. I had to do some videos, buy some things like uniforms in the uh, uh, markets of uh, Moscow. Tenemos el otro proyecto, que es, uh, Santa Inocencia. Santa Inocencia, como ha dicho Agustín, uh, tiene que ver con uh, esas excrecencias, ¿no? esa basura del correo electrónico, el spam. ¿no? Y dentro del spam hay una categoría que es el scam, que son aquellos mensajes que intentan engañarnos y sacar provecho de alguna manera de nosotros. ¿no? Entonces, por ejemplo, hay los típicos uh, ejemplos de scam, de uh, soy una chica del este, no sé qué, uh, he visto tu perfil en Facebook, uh, me parece que congeniamos, ¿qué te parece si correspondemos y mantenemos una comunicación epistolar durante un tiempo y tal? ¿no? Al cabo de, de, unas, de un intercambio, pues uh, esa chica dice, oye, pues ahora que ya nos conocemos, me gustaría venir a conocerte, ah, pero no tengo dinero para pagar el billete, uh, tengo solo la mitad, ¿por qué no me pagas tú la otra mitad? y luego te la devuelvo, no sé qué, y si pillas el anzuelo, pues ya, ya está, la has cagado. O sea, le, le envías el dinero y ya no, ya no vuelves a, a saber de, de esta posible no, novia rusa, termino enseguida. Entonces, yo, yo un día recibo un email y además, eh, así como el otro proyecto lo, lo realicé durante años de documentación, de mucha lectura 
eh, mucha literatura técnica de, de cómo funcionan los cohetes, me salía el dedillo, la velocidad de escape, las, las órbitas gravitacionales, en fin, todo, ¿no? En ese momento, o sea, tuve que realmente aprender mucho. En este caso, fue un proyecto que resolví en 15 días, porque se trataba de eh, dar eh, un, un output, una salida, a una residencia artística en Albarracín, la Fundación de allí invita a escritores, a artistas plásticos a estarse en estancias cortas y producir algún tipo de proyecto. ¿no? Entonces, yo llego al Barracín y se me ocurre utilizar justamente eh, esta, este scam, esta, esta basura uh, de email, como material de trabajo. Y uh, estando allí, recibo, y me parece fantástico, un email de un tío que se, pre que se presenta como el sargento Tom Hook. O sea, Tom Hook es Capitán Garfio. O sea, yo soy el, el, el perdón al sargento, el Capitán Tom Hook. ¿no? Ese, ese tío no se ha leído a, a Parry, ¿no? no sabe quién es Peter Pan. O sea, puestos a inventar cualquier nombre porque necesariamente Garfio. ¿no? Bueno, la cuestión es que no sabía de literatura el pobre hombre. Y la cuestión que me cuenta que es un soldado americano que ha estado en la guerra de Irak y que fue de los primeros en entrar en el eh, cuartel de Saddam Hussein y que eh, los eh, altos eh, funcionarios de, de, de eh, sirios pues tuvieron que eh, escapar precipitadamente y entonces olvidaron en un container pues eh, toda una serie de sacas con eh, dinero en diferentes eh, divisas, ¿no? Yens, eh, marcos, perdón, eh, francos eh, suizos. Uh, with uh, French and Swiss, uh, and Jurians and many other currencies. And so he uh, sent uh, to me a link to the BBC where, uh, well, this uh, is uh, sort of uh, told to be true. We were the first group to get there before the authorities seized that money. So we were the first ones to get there. So before the authorities, we got some money. And we've been told that you are somebody that might help us invest this money or do some charity because, uh, you know, given everything that is happening in the Middle East and Iran, Iraq, uh, we are quite worried, and then I answer back, well, you are the, talking to the right person, I can provide you the best possible way to invest your money, this money that you uh, stole uh, from Saddam Hussein. Anyway, I'm going to tell you something. I know a little bit about uh, photography, and I know photography sometimes is uh, tricky or misleading. You are sending me here a picture, and this is just a link to a British uh, broadcasting uh, network. Would you please send me a, a picture? And he sends this picture to me. Oh, all right. Great, great. I see we're doing fine and you stick to your word, but excuse me to be so skeptical that I am an expert on photography and it can be very misleading. How can you confirm that behind that money, as happens in many of the uh, gangsters' uh, movies, uh, uh, This is not just like uh, the top layer with the currency and everything else is just like a regular paper. So give me more uh, details. So he's sending me these other pictures and uh, say, okay, now I trust you. My name is Font Cuberta. I am a priest in a church in Barcelona called the Sacred Family. And for a while we've been trying to finish this uh, church, but we never find the money to do so. So I think your money will be great. So we don't have to ask for any more money. And also they are building the underground underneath. So everything is kind of shaking. So your money will be very good to uh, finish our project. So now I am sending you my pictures so you get to know me. Now you please send me your pictures so I get to know you. This is Captain Hook. So then the goal of this uh, art uh, residency was to produce a book, a book where I had to show al Barracin. This is a medieval Arab walled uh, uh, village or town. It was siege 
many times, but it was never uh, conquered by an open army. So you uh, work for the Navy, so I'm going to tell you the story of Albarracin. And he said, okay, but let's talk about the money. And I would answer back, no, first of all, I'm going to describe to you what the walls are like in Albarracin. And uh, well, he wanted, well, the money is in a safe, and my salary in the Navy does not, uh, is not enough uh, for me to brave, uh, bribe anybody, so you have to send me this amount of money. And I would say, of course, if you're giving me all these millions, there's no issue, I will uh, give you, I'll give you this money. And then I will answer back. I will keep on talking about the walls and the medieval town. And uh, since I had to write a book, and the book uh, was uh, 128 pages uh, long. I had to uh, send 60 messages to him, and then he will send back uh, another 60 messages, and that will be my book. So when I got si to 60 messages, uh, then I told him, well, bad news, the Bishop of Barcelona knows about this, and the Vatican is against this. I can no longer communicate uh, with you, but do not worry because, uh, I mean, the deal is still on, but I think it will be uh, the bishops dealing with this, and then he was sort of insulting me and saying, well, this is not true, fair, you shouldn't do this and that. Well, it doesn't matter, that was the end of the story, but then I had all these uh, uh, messages to write my book, and uh, then you can pu I publish this, and then uh, you use different filters, yellow or red uh, filters, and depending on what you want, uh, you can have one or other true. So as Agustin said, every true truth is uh, temporary until a new truth uh, comes and uh, changes that reality or that uh, truth. So this is the book of an artist done in Alba Racin for 15 uh, days that at the very end I found out that he uh, was in fact in Bangkok, not in Iraq. And this is uh, how I got to do the Holy Innocence book. Increíble, increíble, increíble al mismo tiempo. Incredible, incredible at the same time. And now we're moving on to Christina. Very quickly. It was very interesting. If I am right, you wanted to also uh, light up the walls in Albarracin for it to look more like uh, Hollywood. So, Christina, let us uh, share. I mean, let's uh, let us get to know about your two projects. I always thought that talking after you was a terrible idea, but because what am I going to tell them now? Well, honestly, when I was invited to this festival, I thought it was interesting to sort of share common elements in your work and my work, even though sometimes common elements have different intentions. Así más puntos, ¿no? Entonces, yo también voy a explicar... I'm going to explain also my space of version that is very incredible and another project about Spanish, not that we copy each other, it's just like our sort of paths uh, cross uh, somehow at different points in time. So John, he made up a space uh, trip and he makes it uh, believable, even though it is uh, not tr uh, true. In my case, it was the opposite. I found a true, truly unbelievable space trip. So then I made pictures to provoke uh, the audience not to believe it. So I will play with prejudices and what we expect from a space uh, program, combining two big iconographic uh, sources like Africa and the space uh, uh, race. 
And many of us, we've not been to Africa or to the space, but we both have uh, these uh, references of uh, uh, sunset in the uh, Serengeti and the uh, space uh, ships that we've uh, been uh, seeing in pictures. So then in uh, 1964, when Africa was being decolonized in Zambia, to prove the world that they were a new great uh, power, they decided to do the same as any other uh, great power we was in at the time, they wanted to put a man in the moon. They started with an alternative underground uh, project, even though it was officially supported for a while. This uh, got them nowhere. It was very ambitious. They wanted to put a man in the man with uh, a system that they had uh, uh, designed. Of, it was a catapult. And then the, from uh, then from the moon, uh, have this man going to uh, Mars. And there they were going to have a boy to cut and a missionary man because they wanted also to sort of uh, take also religion to the space. But in the 60s where everybody was sort of on drugs and LSD and whatever, why not? Everything was possible at the time. So, well, you didn't have to add much to the story. The story by itself without me intervening was incredible, was great and beautiful. But there were not many documents on it. So what I decided was to create a space, a program to add to it some truth by means of photographies, using iconography and taking the stereotypes to the very uh, uh, edge. So I would uh, have this space uh, close with African uh, clothing or, or fabric and then to make it look very naive, almost like uh, a comic, I would use some archives. These are some of the few documents that we have, an article where the project leading uh, Edward Makuka Coloso, uh, he wrote this article presenting to the Zambia people what the project was about. I modified this. I was not as sophisticated as Joanne. Mine was just about copy-paste. And then this was about uh, building and recreating images that would come to my mind just by when I closed my eyes and thinking of Africa and the space. You uh, put this together, shake it well, and this is what you get. Well, I came from the world of a uh, comic. I had many references by Fla of uh, Flash Gordon, Barbarella, Tintin, and everything combined there very well. I needed an elephant because Africa means elephant and otherwise it is not really Africa, but of course this picture is often, I mean people often talk to me about this uh, uh, picture because this was not an African elephant but an Indian African. They don't see an astronaut dressed as, uh, an African dressed as an astronaut. People, what they pay attention to is the size of the ear of the elephant and this, this is like a micro love story and once you create your images you have to sort of uh, uh, link them. There is also sex in my images and then also the reproduction of some iconic uh, uh, of uh, pictures. This is something I did at the entry uh, by my house. I don't have uh, money to travel in time or to Zambia, so everything was done at the outskirts of uh, Campello. And my budget uh, to recreate and create images to explain this uh, uh, project was less than a thousand euros, included the elephant, the uh, suit, and the spaceship. But to me, this was a way to know how only with a camera, an idea, and a good story, you could really create uh, a, s a chronicle, some data, and report on something that did happen. Nobody knew about the Zambian space uh, program, but now we know about it. Then many things were improvised, like, for example, here. Here I need some um, scientific iconography and uh, you have to use uh, charts and drawings and I did this in two minutes. And the indication in the arrows, it is like five uh, finger gloves or like uh, a coconut water tank. 
and uh, like Australia, it was a working title, but then that was it at the end. Uh, this was just like a game to me, and it was all uh, fruit of improvisation. And to me, the important thing was not to uh, share this anecdote of what was going on in Africa in the 60s, but rather to reproduce uh, my reaction the first time I heard about this story. How I found out about this story is the longest story itself. I just like bump into this uh, website with uh, the most uh, weird experiments in history. And there was this BBC interview to Edouard Macuco Colosso. And I thought, oh my God, uh, John von Cuberta, he did it, and it was very good. This cannot be true. But the issue was not who, who's done it. The issue was that I never considered possible that Africa, because it was Africa, could go to the moon because it was the moon. So there was a prejudice, and even though I'm a well-traveled uh, person, I thought I didn't have any prejudices, but without me realizing, I was uh, thinking that uh, this continent uh, didn't have that potential based on my prejudices. And this is what the project is about. So formally, Many things sort of converge, and we talk about improbable, incredible space uh, programs. My, my job is not that much about something that is historic and about a change of era, but rather about our expectations on Africa. And this is the basis, the, the debate that I try to. Uh, to, to start, then I had this uh, Malik Sidibe uh, picture, only I added the uh, helmets to uh, his dancers, and then all these, I've never been to, to Africa almost when I was doing this. So this was just uh, uh, documents on my own stereotypes and my uh, prejudices. So a book was published. And this is why I am here somehow. I got uh, together many archive uh, pictures, like I went to Roswell, uh, where in the 60s uh, these alleged aliens uh, were supposed to have appeared. I went to Roswell back. There is these uh, aliens uh, museum, and this was a typical picture that any tourist would do. And later on, some three years later, this is a key uh, a picture because otherwise, how would I uh, have an alien that looks uh, real? And uh, so I was. Uh, playing with my archives, and I never thought anybody was going to take me uh, so seriously, so I was doing things very freely. I was playing with the uh, photographers as well. I needed a spaceship, something flying. So if you turn these upside down, this is something that is floating, uh, floating in a lake. But if you turn it upside down, it is flying. So everything was very limited, and I had uh, to follow a script. Uh, so to me, it was a way to, uh, in a very funny way, experiment. This was in 2012. But in 29, I was already deceived with the press, and I was trying to tell the stories in another way. And I was uh, asked uh, to do uh, for Foto España in a gallery an exhibition. So at the time, I was doing a documentation. I was going to do some documentation of uh, uh, children slaves or slavery uh, in children. And uh, I thought, well, you cannot show that on, in an exhibition. So rather than putting uh, spams uh, into the, the garbage, I would collect them. So I did something that I really like a lot. And to be aware when you're reading what kind of images you, you sort of produce in your brain, what sorts of uh, links happen in your uh, brain so you create images when you're reading. So this is what I did. I collected some spams and I uh, then finally took eight out of my collection and I read again these spams. Well, this is very difficult for you to read them, but... Uh, these are spams, as Joanne mentioned, these emails that you get and that people sort of offer you the best uh, possibility or chance ever or telling you that you're winning the lottery. In if astronaut is something that did happen and images sort of made you doubt about it, here is the other way. Images are certifying that is 
not true from the very beginning. But anyway, the dynamics in between of what happened and what might have happened and the version I gave with my image, images is always misleading. So this is like a two-way uh, journey. So you have to go, come back. It's not like with the press. You see a heading and you see a, a woman that fell down. There is no dynamics in between the uh, heading and the text and the image. And this was very frustrating to me. So here I reread my spam. And how am I going to uh, imagine a man working in a bank in Togo? And I don't have any visual uh, images or references of a bank in Togo. I know what an elephant looks like, but I didn't know how an office, a bank office, would be like in uh, Togo. So I did go there. This is what an African bank uh, looks like. And. Um, there is this orphan girl asking me to marry her because this is the only way for her to inherit for her from her parents if she gets married before the age of 30. And uh, all these images are portraits uh, based on what you said previously, translating text and icons of how a woman desperate to get married would look like. Uh, so she lives in London, so there's a kettle at the back, and uh, the, the, the colors are cold. And then this is a lawyer that also found an abandoned account with a lot of money, and he wants to share it with me. I went there, and I told him that I was doing something else because no lawyer wanted to uh, pose uh, for me when I explained the story to them. So I told him a lie. I had no scrapbooks at the time, but now I am a bit better. This is also I think with uh, the fake now I've uh, grown to be better. I had no scrapbooks in the back in the past. So these are uh, some spans that uh, ended up being a book. This is a man working uh, in the city in London. He also finds uh, an account of uh, an African uh, army man. Uh, so he was in uh, in uh, London. So this is a fake because the, this picture was taken in the uh, CAM, it's a saving, uh, it's a saving a Spanish savings uh, bank uh, in uh, Valencia that has been uh, leading to many frauds uh, recently. So the, he, I add uh, uh, a postca postcard of Gibraltar, the Paddington Bear. So this is like a joke, but to look it, look, make it look very like uh, Londonian. So apart from the joke, and this is very funny how you can translate text into images. And the most interesting was when this uh, exhibition was opened in Foto España because there was nobody at the time and people attending your opening uh, are your friends, your mom, some of your neighbors. If you've got nothing better to do, they all come and say, oh, it looks uh, great. And they know nothing. They don't understand anything. But my photography a boss uh, from the uh, newspaper Información came. And he came and he said, this is uh, great. How did you, could you access these people? How, how did they let you make these pictures? And I would tell him, well, come on. I didn't have uh, even have uh, holidays. When do you think I've been to Togo? So every week we would be seeing each other. But since there was a picture there with a text that was absolutely impossible, certifying that uh, picture, that turned into a very good piece of research. And I think that really opened, opened to me the eyes, uh, my eyes to thinking and, and that opening that really is something that is really a fiction, if it is confirmed by a picture, then it turns into something else. And from there, here we are. So I think you know the series, otherwise you can uh, watch them in the website. Bueno, yo creo que lo, lo que está lo que está muy claro es que sois dos grandes narradores. Well, it's clear is that you are very good narrators. Two of you are extraordinary storytellers. 
and that you play this game of misleading with the translation of things when something is translating into a piece of paper, into photography is uh, true, as your boss has thought. This man called uh, Rafa, Rafael. So you pervert this code in a pedagogic uh, way, but also in, in a fun way, in a playful way. It's not only sort of uh, pedagogic. And we have to give the floor to the audience, but before we do so, I would like to say, to conclude, that we will compare your works. Joan, you are always, well, in these two cases at least, you are one of the leading actors. And Christina, at least in these uh, uh, works or jobs, you are rather an observer and you sort of look at things through a window, through a hole. So you are the storyteller as a spy and you, Joanne, you are the storyteller but as a leading actor. Well, in my case, I had some projects in which uh, I do not appear as an actor. I don't perform myself, and this was given to some uh, circumstances at the time. I had to travel to Moscow, so I had to also take an actor with me that would mean more money, and also that would mean that I had to be able to direct actors, and I didn't have that capacity. I didn't know how to explain somebody uh, to do a certain face. The, it was easier for me to do it myself. So it was so much fun. But then I decided to always do it in such a way. So from then on, I decided to be in my projects myself. Well, it's very punky what you do, is this do it yourself. Because only you know how you want things. And then you are so good at it, you're so, so very good at manipulating images. I mean, the first time I saw that, you know, do you watch this TV show, Quarto Millennium, Fourth Millennium? She's asking. Sometimes I watch it because I like how they build these fakes. But once you see a couple of emissions, you know what that storytelling is like, and I don't like it. But the first time I saw your project, I didn't think it was you, Joan. So... Uh, I think it was great. It's already uh, half past eight, so I don't know if somebody in the audience has a comment. We don't see you, so I don't know if uh, they could put the light a bit down. Okay, there are human people out there. Uh, human beings out there. I've got a question for Christina. Maybe you've got this question often. Is it not better for you to translate this uh, storytelling into cinema? Yes, I often uh, thought of this, but you need a huge team uh, to do cinema, and I'd like to work on my own and to be able to control everything myself and to do everything sort of uh, by myself. I like So far, I like to control this production myself. Do you think it's a myth that cinema needs uh, so much? Yes, maybe. You could do it with a smaller team. I think next step when I sort of take some time, I think it's going to be some image in movement. Only uh, when you do a photography, uh, you sort of seize a moment and you let people sort of guess what's happening uh, after. And from this point of view, I have to find the language in, uh, that will let me say so in cinema because I don't want things to be very evident, obvious. 
because uh, pictures always sort of uh, give you this mystery, like what was there before and after. And I don't know if you can do that in the cinema, but that story like Astronaut, and also I've made other stories that are very much like uh, uh, something that could be translated into cinema, like uh, in a documentary type. Yes, I think these fake documentaries there are so many fake documentaries, he says, that it is difficult not to make uh, uh, people think that it is true. I think in cinema, there are so many fake documentaries already, uh, so it reaches the point where the language is no longer that powerful. Well, I disagree, says Joanne, because you are thinking on conventional distribution uh, channels. And what you have to do precisely is to present that material in such a way and to such circumstances that would make it uh, uh, believable. Yes, use other platforms like YouTube that still enjoy some credibility, she says. So maybe you can sort of squeeze it in. You're thinking about a cinema, uh, uh, yes, a standard cinema room. Uh, theater. But imagine you just present this project uh, in a schools. You go to schools and you uh, say, well, this is what we found out, and you do a performance in a school. <laughs> and this other man, uh, Agustin, says, well, you will end up in prison. Nowadays, you will end up in prison if you go to school and tell them something that is fake. Yeah, well, you are used to thinking that a distribution should be in a certain way. And the important thing is that you break these conventions and you find new ways, new places where a trick might be effective. Yes, we have to find the means, the mean to do that. But I wouldn't go to schools. Careful. Christine, I don't do that. If you do that, just let him talk so he ends up himself in prison, not you. Good afternoon. I found uh, all this very interesting since uh, the very beginning. Given your job, how do you see fake news yourselves when they don't have your uh, purpose, but ra rather to modify the public opinion, uh, political decisions? Can you fight it with your work? Do you think you educate uh, the audience or you sort of create some uh, skepticism or how do you see it? Joanne says that I think my work is a way to vaccinate somehow people. That is inoculating the virus of a fiction, a virus of fiction to create antibodies. So even though the effect is uh, very uh, humble, this is about uh, prevention. This is about uh, doing a prophylactic uh, work or pedagogic uh, work. If Christina and myself were just uh, uh, photographers with ideas, with camera, with computer, were able to cheat on so many people, what would not be doing the large corporations, the governments and the intelligence uh, agencies with all the unlimited means that they have available? So at a very small scale, that is what we try to do. We are just sort of uh, uh, telling people, watch out, uh, you know, be critical, be skeptical in relation to uh, the news we get. You don't buy the first news uh, that they try to sell you. Well, I had this romantic vision that with photography you are going to show the true reality of things to your audience that is comfortably watching you at home. So this is this myth of the photographer that is uh, a country saver. From that, I moved to having people, by means of my work, questioning the press. My new romantic dream is that the audience will end up uh, questioning more things and uh, when I left Spain and I moved to London for some years, I realized uh, the great difference uh, in the press. Most uh, headlines are questions in the press or are exclamation marks. In Spain, it is rather this is the way it is. A headline is like a statement. And... Uh, 
then you see that idea and then you know they're sort of trying to make you uh, swallow that uh, in England, not in, in the States, they rather in the headlines make questions. And I think this is a very healthy exercise. This is uh, when you open the newspaper, it makes you think. And uh, photography would no longer be just uh, anything but a small part of uh, reality and then became uh, the beginning of a thousand uh, questions and I think this is what people should do if you don't want to be a sheep, uh, yes, like and survive, start questioning things. Then there is also the idea that fake news are something new, but no, it is not true. Well, is that the landing on the moon that was done by Stanley uh, Kubrick? Yeah, they never put a man on the moon. Well, fake news. This is a word I really like because it comes from the States, the United States. And this is my theory that maybe I should document. I've got this idea that this is a term that is being defined to justify uh, telling lies in a way that is very powerful because uh, Protestants in, uh, in uh, the protest to Protestants, the worst things are lies. In a Catholic uh, religion or culture, telling lies is not only um, okay, it's really the driver of our society. For Anglo-Saxons, telling lies is the worst. If you watch a film by Fellini or Bergman, you see the two ends, the two... So I think this is a way to make uh, lying possible without having to resign because Bill Clinton didn't resign or wasn't about to resign because he was abusing or uh, because of the kind of sexual uh, uh, relationship that was an abuse. No, it's because he told a lie. So for Protestants, uh, your life equals to your job, to your work. So you cannot have as a public uh, uh, persona one life and as a private persona another life. To me, this is ridiculous. But maybe fake news are fake. Yes, we should just uh, uh, say they are lies. We shouldn't say fake news. We should say, yes, bluntly, it is a lie, Christina says. Yes, but this is a way not to end up in hell. But with the broader point of view, I think uh, when you manipulate propaganda, when you manipulate uh, stories, uh, this is something that was always there. If you take uh, the uh, uh, wars uh, by Julius and Caesar, it was uh, propaganda. To me, the difference in between alternative uh, events, that is another way to call these, that is very interesting, uh, this post-truth or fake news, this is also related to the way in which you see media not, not as a jerky. And uh, rather now we have a democratic participation in the social networks. Uh, we thought that internet would save democracy. Now we realize that is not the case. Now we realize that precisely that is uh, really dangerous because of all these uh, news that are artificial, that have been artificially created uh, for some uh, hidden benefits, uh, and that might be really ruining democracy. So to me, fake news uh, and these uh, belong to a post-photography era, to an era dominated by the acceleration of information, by 
the existence of a social network, of the digital mobiles, uh, of instant uh, cameras, of uh, facial recognition uh, programs and cameras. So we are in such a, a political communicational uh, landscape that is so different that is uh, precise, precisely leading to this differentiated uh, figure of the post-true of uh, fake news. Yes, and to add to that, how these uh, news are um, diffused or uh, or how they extend is faster. Yes, some people they don't read the news, but or the newspapers, but uh, people find everything on the internet. So in Congo, for a week before the elections, internet didn't work at all because they knew this would have an impact on the, uh, people. People that would not watch the news will not even read a political program. Then in Brazil, the same happened. Yes, but this is you're considering people as uh, silly because you know, so like you cannot like getting here because here you might be a sort of contaminated or polluted, but they are not silly. Yeah, and then there is the big data and the bubble effect. We have this uh, idea that we are in a transparent society where we have access to all information, and it is just the opposite. We only get the information that can uh, corroborate our uh, beliefs uh, because we have these uh, ways in which uh, information is uh, biased. So I then only have easy access to some particular data. So never before to find out about something you have to read. So many newspapers, especially from places away from where news are happening because we are giving up on information and what we are really, uh, rather trying is to uh, uh, format uh, the public opinion in a certain way. I think uh, Spanish newspapers are no longer doing journalism, they're doing uh, politics. So in order to do that, we have now technology that makes this uh, possible. So I think this is something one cannot judge only from the uh, photographic uh, point of view. This is a global issue, and this is uh, uh, due to the uh, communication and political circumstances that we live in. And we've got somebody, uh, we've got here a clock saying we're running out of time. This is a metaphysical uh, counter. A friend of mine had uh, this uh, washing machine that was met metaphysical that said uh, time is out. We are running out of time. And uh, I would just request a round of applause for uh, Christina de Miguel and Joan Foncuberta.